Hi everybody, this is Nathan Hale. I'm here doing my uh, my best impression of a Comic-Con panel if you were to come and see me. Look, I even dug up a lanyard. There's nothing on my lanyard, but I didn't feel good presenting you know, without a lanyard on. I dug up one of my old uh, paneling name placards, you know, so we can mentally put this down in front of me. So it just really feels like we're all together at a Comic-Con. Um, my name is Nathan Hale. I am a cartoonist. I'm the cartoonist who does the Hazardous Tales series. And this uh, little uh, speech I'm going to give right here is about 10 years of Hazardous Tales. Which is a funny title because I've only been doing it for 8 years. But I just finished book 10. Let me give you a little rundown of what we're going to do today. I had to write it down. First of all, we're in the introduction. That's what I'm doing right now. Hello. Glad you guys watched this video. I like to tell people when they come to my Comic-Con panels or uh, uh, any sort of uh, fan festival panel that uh, if you go to a Comic-Con, you're a big nerd. But if you go to the history panel at a Comic-Con, you are a super duper nerd. So thanks for coming to this history thing. Uh, first things first, I want to tell you that I just finished an all-nighter. What does that mean? That means I stayed up all night because of a deadline. Uh, the deadline was my most recent Hazardous Tale book, uh, book number 10. I literally just finished it uh, around, I'm going to say around 5.50, maybe 6 o'clock this morning. Uh, and then spent another hour formatting the files and putting them on my publisher's uh, Dropbox file. Uh, 128 finished pages of comics all just went to my great publisher at Abrams books and uh, I was right here on this uh, computer right here all night long I have uh, I've done I want to say let's see 10 hazardous tales two Rapunzel books two science fiction and fantasy books uh, that's uh, 14 14 graphic novels and I Every single one of them, when it came down to the end, I had to do an all-nighter or huh, a series of all-nighters or nights in which I didn't get a whole lot of sleep. You'd think by 14 books I would have figured this out. Um, unfortunately, no. And I, I used to be very proud of myself when I started my career as a freelance illustrator because as a freelance illustrator, picture book illustrator, I was very proud uh, to be somebody who never ever missed a deadline never asked for a deadline extension I always landed those deadlines but as soon as I started graphic novels I learned the pain of pushing deadlines and asking for more time and requesting and coming up with terrible excuses. as well even on this one I had to ask for an extra week I did this book Hazardous Tales number 10 during the pandemic. The funny thing is, I literally would have spent the last three months almost the exact same way, whether there was no viral pandemic or not. I still would have been sitting here cranking out comic pages day after day after day after day. Um, in fact, it was really fascinating to have this much of a time period where I didn't go anywhere. Um, I think I went to uh, the grocery store what's uh since i started the final artwork for this book way back uh in march so this was a uh three month graphic novel uh meaning the artwork uh meaning the final artwork i had a loosely sketched um 128 pages the inking the coloring all of that final stuff i did in three months and most of uh, my brain power was used up last night going completely into all-nighter mode. Um, so if I seem a little punchy, if I seem a little weird, if I seem a little uh, overtired, it's because I think I have more uh, caffeine in my system than, than blood right now. But uh, this is the last day I could put this video together, and I've been thinking about it ever since uh, I was told that, the, that we got a slot uh, on the... Uh, on the, uh, uh, the, the Comic-Con uh, digital thing that we're doing right now. So, all-nighter. Let's get to it, though. I'm still not done. Here's the terrible thing. 
All of the interior artwork is done, but guess what else is due today? And I'm going to jump into it straight after I finish this. Uh, the end paper. The end paper. And my end paper in my Hazardous Tales books are always maps. So, um, huh, this is a very useful map right here. Look, we can see what is the United States, what's France, what's Spain, and what's England. See, look, it's beautiful. The, see, I haven't put the colors in yet, so we don't know what's what. That's one side, and then over here is the other side. What is book 10 about? We'll get into that in a little bit. So, All Nighter is done. That was our intro. 10 years of this wacky series, The Hazardous Tales. 10 of these books. I honestly can't believe it. Um, I never planned to be the person who got into um, history comics. Uh, it's one of the great and amazing and, and lucky experiences of my life to find myself being uh, that guy who does history comics. Uh, but there they are, all 10 of them. These are my, uh, these copies are banged up because each one of these that you're looking at right here uh, are like the first one that the publisher sent to me, you know, like the, the sample first one. So some of them are a little banged up because I, I keep them for reference. Um, so many all-nighters that you're looking at right here. Um, these books, if you don't know these books, all of these books are true stories about American history, but told in a fun comic book style where characters talk to each other. If you want to see what uh, what Lafayette has to say when he shouts at George Washington, well, you got to read that book. If you want to hear what uh, the people who first the the first uh, European explorers to go through the Grand Canyon had to say in 1869, well, you got to check out that book. When you put the history in a comic book form, uh, it it brings it to life in a way that I don't think is possible in any other way. Um, even like an animated. A cartoon type of thing I think is a different it's a completely different animal um, and I feel sorry for anybody out there who's trying to put together an animated history show because oof that just sounds boring or just a strictly uh, written uh, nonfiction story without uh, all of the exciting drawings that's a big challenge um, to put them in comic book uh, format I think is just the uh, the most amazing way to do it I visit a lot of schools part of my job has been visiting schools and talking to students about uh, uh, about history. Believe it or not, most kids aren't dying to just run and grab a history book. They need to be shown how exciting it can be. When I do my presentations, I do a lot of silly drawing up in front of the kids, and um, that gives them the, uh, the idea, hey, maybe I should look into this stuff. And they read these books and they enjoy them. But I always ask, what's your favorite book? Um, and I get a lot of different answers, but I, I've been tallying them in my brain. And I've noticed over the years, one of the most popular ones that I get again and again, what's your favorite? They go to this World War I book, uh, Treaties, Trenches, Mud, and Blood. That is a very common one, um, mostly with boys. Um, I don't know if I've ever talked to um, a girl reader who said the World War I story was their favorite. Um, often when I talk to girls, third, fourth, fifth grade girls, they tend to prefer this book right here, the Donner Party book. Actually, their answers are more varied than the boys, but I would say 90% of boys, when I talk to them, they go right here, Treaty Trenches, Mono Blood, the World War I book. I don't know why. It has the, uh, there's no main character. The war itself is kind of the main character. It has the fewest jokes. It's the most complicated, but that's the one that they love the best. Um, this one right here, Big Bad Ironclad, kind of my secret favorite one. Usually when people ask me which of the books is my favorite, I just tell them the one I'm working on is my favorite. Because that's, that's true. I'm more excited about what's coming up next than what's gone behind me. Uh, Big Bad Ironclad, I think, is secretly the funniest one. And it has the least amount of human suffering in it. Uh, so I've always kind of liked old Big Bad Ironclad. Uh, these are the books that look like this. If you haven't seen these around, very excited right now because the publisher has put out big versions, almost like an artist's edition copy. These are almost twice as large as the existing books. Artwork is much bigger. The covers are all fancy and embossed. Ooh, look at that embossed eagle right there. Ooh, the flags are embossed. 
Alamo All Stars came out last year, and this year we are putting out the Donner Party book in a big, beautiful embossed version. Um, if you're a fan of the books, uh, or if you have, if you're like me and have bad eyes, these are a great way to read them. We're gonna work our way slowly through all of them. The cool thing about these is they have 16 extra pages of mini comics inside. Uh, comics that you can't get anywhere else. Um, I've got a fun comic inside this one about uh, oxen and uh, how oxen are created. Oxen is a weird animal. It's not a species. It's something that humans do to an existing animal. If you want to find out what that is, you got to check this book out. Alamo All-Stars has an amazing story about uh, a historical character by the name of uh, Phil Collins. Did you know Phil Collins, the musician, is like the world's foremost Alamo artifact collector? He donated everything he collected over a lifetime of collecting to the Alamo a few years ago, and they made him an honorary Texan. I make a little mini comic about Phil Collins. That's a sentence I never thought I would say. I made a mini comic about Phil Collins. Anyway, these big issues are great. Check them out. Um, they are a lot of fun. Let's see what's next down here. Okay. So it's really only been eight years, but a lot of books. Over a thousand pages now of Hazardous Tales. Is that right? 128 pages times 10. I'm going to say over a thousand. Not a mathematician. Scott McCloud's story. So, I met the great cartoonist and uh, historian and all-around great explainer Scott McCloud at, uh, I believe it was, um, it was either San Diego Comic-Con or possibly ALA, the Librarian Conference. But it was at a Scholastic Graphics event. They were having a, a party for all of the Scholastic uh, Graphics cartoonists. Raina Telgemeier was there. Great uh, event, and I went to it. And uh, this guy comes up to me, and he just starts talking. And I didn't know who he was. Now, if he'd look like that little cartoon we see from the uh, Understanding Comics books, then I would have said, oh, you're Scott McCloud. But he doesn't look like that little cartoon. He looks like a real person. Anyway, he came up to me, and he said, oh... Nathan Hale, huh? And I was like, oh, yeah? And he said, you're that history comics guy. And I said, oh, yeah, that's me. Thanks for recognizing me. And he said, I'm Scott McCloud. And I said, oh. And he said, do you know what history comics are? And I said, um, what do you mean? And he said, history comics are like that location in your downtown area. The best location in all of downtown. You know, right at that busy intersection in the best part of downtown. But that location is perfect for a restaurant. And every year, a new restaurant opens up there and goes out of business. And then another one opens up. And then another one opens up. And another one opens up. And even though it's the best location around, that amazing location never stays in business. That's what history comics are. I was like, oh. Thanks, Scott McCloud. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 no. You seem to be making that location work. And I was like, this is the greatest conversation I've ever had. And then he disappeared into the crowd. Uh, and I've now told that story 10 different times on 10 different uh, interviews and stuff. But I love the sentiment of it, that, that uh, it's a great location. And I actually do see more and more people coming into this location. Going to be lots of great history comics coming out uh, uh, this year alone. First, Second is launching their history comic series that's sort of like the science comic series. Looking forward to reading those. Um, lots of, uh, of interesting stuff coming out. It'll be interesting to see who can keep their great location open. And I love it. I read all history comics. I'm, I'm crazy for both comics and history. That is my Scott McCloud story. Woo! Cross that one out. How I make the books. You know what? How are we doing on time here? I don't want to bore everybody by talking too long. I am a firm believer in writing everything first. And when you're doing nonfiction, you really do. You have to do all of that reading, research, writing. I will write the whole manuscript, right? My manuscripts for my books, since I'm the artist, I don't have to write too many detailed descriptions of the of the artwork. My manuscripts really just look like a play, you know, with the, with the dialogue and the character names. I 
know in my mind what the images are going to be so I don't have to give myself that direction. Um, when I write a manuscript, it's mostly research. I go to the library and I check out every single book I can. I check out all of the books on that subject matter. Uh, if I like the book, I buy the book. I then look at the bibliography of that book and try and buy those books. And really, I would just like to get a nice big stack of books going. I take all of my reading and research and I crunch it down to about maybe 90 pages of uh, double space dialogue type. Between 90 and 110, I think. Um, this most recent book, oh, good grief, I can't remember numbers. I don't even know what I'm trying. Um, but this little manuscript, I polish it all up, I get everything checked out, and then I take this, I haven't drawn anything yet. I don't design the characters, I don't start sketching, I'm not even thinking about the visuals at this point. It's all about research, and it's all about taking this research and ordering it in such a way that it feels compelling. This leads to this, leads to this, to this big surprise that we weren't expecting, you know, that kind of uh, thing. When I'm doing this, I can't even have music with lyrics playing. I listen to a lot of uh, just uh, music with no, uh, with no vocals. Um, and even sometimes I just have to have it completely quiet. When this manuscript is finished, I drop it into a, a little uh, Word document file and I send it off to my publishers in New York City. Now, it's gotta go through three people. These three people, uh, first one is my editor and she's great. She's reading this thing like a story. She's not a nonfiction editor. She is a fiction editor. Most of her, uh, uh, the authors that she works with write uh, novels, fiction. She's not a graphics, uh, graphic novel editor or a nonfiction editor. So she is reading this thing like it's a story, like it's a play. So she'll be like, this right here, I don't understand why we have this whole chapter. It doesn't add anything. I'd like more about this, and this is interesting to me. She's approaching this in uh, the same way that a kid would, meaning, is this going to be entertaining? Is this going to be interesting? She jumps in and she reads it like a story. And she makes her notes. She's like, uh, more on this character. This is fun. Uh, I don't like this. You know, she makes her notes, puts those notes on that document. Then she kicks it over to the copy editor. Copy editor, uh, this time out, the, the copy, the final copy edits were one of the things I was doing in my all-nighter last night. Um, I had a real problem with formatting. I would put like the town and then uh, the month and the year. And uh, I kept putting a comma on there, and I guess that comma is no good. So in all of my captions, I had to go through and get rid of that comma. Also, I like to put, you know, May 15th with the TH on there. And uh, I keep forgetting they don't want that TH in there. Anyway, lots of little copy edits, but this is before we get to the artwork. So she goes through, she makes the uh, corrections to all of my spelling and formatting problems like that. Here's a formatting quiz for you, history nerds. History and uh, style nerds. You've got the name of a sailing ship. You want to play, play along in your head. HMS Victory. How do you format this? Did you play along? Did you think about how you would format it? Well, I'll tell you how you format it right now. Capital HMS. No dots. And then italicized the name of the ship, HMS Victory. See, I had a problem in this book. I was italicizing the HMS with the Victory, the, pff, like an idiot. So, proofreading, goes through, she goes through, puts a bunch of marks all over my book. Last of all, they kick it down to the basement where the fact checker lives. The fact checker. Actually, I don't know if they have a basement. I'm sure the fact checker works off site work for hire. I don't even know how it works, but I do know that this person is nasty. This fact checker, and if you don't know what a fact checker is, this is a person whose job it is to make sure that if you are claiming to tell the truth that you are telling the truth. They look at all of your research. If you do documentaries, you have a fact checker. If you do news, you, uh, newspapers, things like that, you have somebody that checks all of your facts. This person is very rigorous. The person they had for a while was this uh, this angry man with a unibrow. I don't, I don't know if he had a unibrow, but boy, he felt like he had a big unibrow. And he wouldn't just correct me. He would correct me in the snarkiest way possible. He'd be like, oh, you you think so? Oh, really? You know, just like, just, just mean and nasty. Um, goes through, puts lots of notes. You should rephrase it like this. According to this account, this is more like this. And this is just wrong. This, you got the wrong date. Change this, change this, change it. They just... They just destroy my beautiful 
manuscript. Manuscript comes back to me and I make all of those corrections. And then, if I was an author, I would be finished. I could just go on vacation and hang out, wait for them to put out the book so that I could read it. But I'm not just an author. I'm a cartoonist. So now, the real work begins. What do I do now? Do I start drawing? Yes, I do. But before I start the drawing, it's time to go back to the research. You have got to find so many books, so many things. You have to figure out what all of the guns are going to look like, what all of the footwear is going to look like. You want to know something crazy about footwear? Until just like, I think it was the uh, early 1800s, there was no left and right shoe. There was just shoes. And as you wore them, it slowly formed into your left and right shoe. Isn't that weird? But these are the kind of facts I have to learn about while I am doing this research. So I get all these different books. Now these are different than the first stack of books. The first stack of books, this is all just heavy text. Now I'm looking for the books with the pictures. Um, there are wonderful resources. Uh, uh, toy soldiers will, will have guides on how to like paint your little figurines and these guides are accurate. Um, ship model builders will have detailed breakdowns of ships from different time periods. I mean, I've found myself in all kinds of crazy places finding this visual reference. Oh, where's my, where's my favorite piece of visual reference? Where did it go? Um, I draw cannons so much, and cannons are the worst. Where's my cannon? Um, cannons are so bad, I had to, um, I just, ah, oh, it's way over here. I bought a cannon, right? This book in particular, this is a nice uh, Napoleon cannon right here. Had to use it again and again. Uh, visual reference. So, I dig out the visual reference and I start drawing. First thing I do, I'm, the, I'm, a, car, I'm a cartoonist who puts their word balloons in first. Fill that space in with those word balloons. That way I can see how the page is going to flow. That way I can see where the pages will each end. I can start giving thought to what's going to have a big space, what's going to have a small space. All of that work, uh, I'm my own inker, I'm my own colorist, I do everything, I'm my own letterer, everything I do. So, the writing part takes about three or four months. This part where the publishers go through everything can take between one and two months, and then the artwork, if there happens to be a pandemic on, I can do it in about three months but it's taken upwards of uh, six months before. So each one of these 10 books can take anywhere between eight to 12 months. And then kids get them and they read them in about 40 minutes. So read slower, kids. Read slower. Book 10 that I just finished is all about the Louisiana Purchase. Let me show you some of these pages that I just finished. And if you go to my YouTube channel, which is Nathan Hale Hazardous Tales, you can see some of these pages in progress. Um, but let me show you, let me show you what's up. Let's pull some of these up and see where it goes. So this is all about the Louisiana Purchase, but not Lewis and Clark, not after the Louisiana Purchase. I wanted to find the steps that led up to the Louisiana Purchase. Why did it happen? When I was in school, all I ever heard about the Louisiana Purchase was that it was a Thomas Jefferson deal and it was a, it was cheap. That was it. Um, I wanted to really figure out these steps. This is one of the biggest, maybe the biggest, I'm not sure, um, historical land grab. The United States doubled in size with a tiny bit of paperwork. It's one of those crazy things. So I wanted to dig deeper into it and figure out what was going on. Um, one of the main characters, one of the main players in this story is Napoleon Bonaparte. He is not somebody I get to draw very much. He doesn't really interact with United States history very much, except for in this case, where he's one of the main players. He's the guy that sold us the Louisiana Purchase. So I talk a little bit about the rise of Napoleon, who he was, where he came from, all kinds of... I, I focus a lot on the young Napoleon when he rose to power. When he rose to power, it was right in the middle of the uh, French Revolution. Um, so there's actually a page or two on the French Revolution. Napoleon was right there. He was at the heart of it. This picture uh, right here was very fascinating to me. Um, there are these uh, elite guards, the King's Swiss Guard, when uh, the mob came to get Marie Antoinette and uh, King Louis. They um, swarmed the palace, and these were the, the best soldiers that they had, but they wouldn't um, use their guns or, or cannons against the, the mob of people, so they were just slaughtered. 
hundreds of these uh, elite Swiss guards were slaughtered at the palace. Napoleon um, uh, saw this. They went in disguise and, and, and witnessed the carnage. Um, one of the amazing pieces of reference I found for this were like postcards and engravings of that time. People had like little, let's frame this picture of all the dead Swiss guard and hang it on the wall. <laughs> anyway, here's my one page thesis on the, uh, the French Revolution. There we go. Here's the great thing about history comics. You can show all the costumes and all the details, but this is maybe the best thing about history comics, and it's this right here. You can take something as deadly serious as a human being being beheaded for political reasons and make it funny. There's a funny sound effect while this man's head is being severed from his body. Look at Can you imagine anything more horrifying than looking down at a basket full of human heads and somehow, in a comic, this is both fun and educational. Isn't that amazing? Anyway, Hangman's very fascinated by this head cut offening. He wants us to do a Lafayette, Lafayette 2, the head cut offening that's going on his list. Um, so we talk about Napoleon. Um, if you want to see this page, this whole spread being drawn in time lapse, go to my YouTube channel and check it out. This is uh, one of Napoleon's big uh, first major campaigns. Ah. Oh. I love drawing this kind of stuff. Sometime in the future, I would like to just do a full, maybe just like some historical fiction or even some fantasy fiction about this kind of crazy warfare, just because it's so crazy and fascinating and interesting to draw. This book has a lot of this big, um, you know, uh, 17th and 18th century type warfare with the cannons and the ships and the uniforms and all of that great, exciting stuff. In the book, check it out. Lots of Napoleon, um, more more Napoleon. I kind of got carried away with the Napoleon stuff. Uh, but hey, it's my history series. I can focus on the things I want to focus on. But he's just a small part of this whole Louisiana Purchase idea. One of the bigger parts was a French colony way out in the Caribbean. You might have noticed that when I was showing you the end paper. A French colony called San Domingue, which later became the nation of Haiti. It's one of the major reasons why Napoleon decided he was done with the New World. One of the things that changed the, uh, that particular um, landscape was mosquitoes. Yellow fever broke out in this French colony. And while Napoleon's troops, at that uh, moment, the best troops in the world, were trying to fight the people of San Domingue, the mosquitoes of San Domingue were fighting back. This book created during a pandemic, features a pandemic, the yellow fever outbreak. The yellow fever outbreak just wiped out Napoleon's forces. Spoiler alerts if you're going to read this book. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to show you this cool picture. I was really happy with how it turned out of these, uh, these soldiers all dying of yellow fever. Oh, look at that. Exciting stuff. Um, we go into uh, a bit more of the paperwork, the back and forth, Thomas Jefferson jumping around and acting like a crazy person. Um, interesting stuff. This guy, um, I love drawing this guy. This is maybe the stupidest designed character I've ever made, but when I got, when I, when I pulled up the pictures of him, uh, this is a, a guy named uh, Livingston, that uh, Livingston and James Monroe were the two guys who kind of brokered the deal in France. And uh, the picture of him made me laugh so hard that I just kept simplifying it until we got to this guy. Um, what a hero. I love him. He, he was hard of hearing, so he used one of those hearing horns. But uh, I was very pleased with this particular <laughs> character. Woo! Punchy. Look at me laughing at my own drawings. Um, lots of amazing uh, battles and skirmishes um, between Napoleon's troops and uh, the people of Haiti. Really fascinating stuff. Stuff I never heard about growing up. The Haitian Revolution is the biggest and, uh, uh, is the, sorry, it's the second revolution in the New World. The first one was France versus, uh, sorry, the first one was the United States versus uh, England. That was the first big revolution. The second one was Haiti versus France. Um, and uh, it's a fascinating story that I never heard about growing up in school. Um, I'm really hoping uh, kids mob their school libraries saying, hey, we want more books on this. We want more books on these heroes, on Toussaint L'Overture and uh, Jean-Jacques Dessalines and these amazing heroes who fought for independence in the nation island of Haiti. 
Uh, it's a super exciting book. I'm very excited for it. It's going to be coming out in October of this year. Um, I should probably pull up the cover for you. Uh, I didn't open it up beforehand. But, uh, you know, it's called Blades of Freedom. Look for it online. You'll see it. Uh, look for any Hazardous Tales. It'll pop up. I think we got a book trailer on the uh, Abrams site for it. But all of this stuff is in the upcoming book. Excited for it. Uh, what's next? A lot of napping. I've been so jealous of... Uh, so many people during the pandemic were, you know, they're playing video games and making bread. And I was just spending this whole pandemic just drawing, trying to meet this deadline. And so many creative people I know were just having a real crisis of trying to work while they were trapped in their home and worried about the future and worried about what's going to happen next. And that was me. I was worried, uh, but I just ugh, white knuckled for the last three months to get through this. So that's what's next. A lot of napping. Um, what's next for the series? I actually don't know. I'm in a little bit of a blank spot right now. Um, we're definitely uh, contracted for more in the future, but for the first time ever, I don't know what the next topic's going to be. I've got a lot of different ideas for what it could be, but I don't have a confirmed one yet. I've talked to a lot of kids who are very fascinated by the Cold War. Maybe that's what we'll work on. I don't know. There's not a whole lot of very specific action with an overview of the Cold War. Kids might find it boring. I don't know. I think a lot of kids think the Cold War is the beginning of the Empire Strikes Back, you know, where a bunch of people are running around in the cold. That's not fair. Uh, been thinking a lot about the Korean War. It could be a very fascinating thing to look into. Uh, War of 1812. Super exciting. They burned down the White House. Who wouldn't want to see that? Um... Kids are always looking for more World War II stories. In fact, if I could say the most requested, hands down the most requested story I get from kids, D-Day. They want D-Day. I don't know. I'm sure all of these will get to at some point. I have no clue. Or maybe it's time to go back and uh, take a break from all that research and human misery to do another uh, science fiction or fantasy book, uh, like my books Apocalypse Taco uh, and One Trick Pony. If you haven't read those, check those out. Zero history, but a lot of fun adventures about robot ponies and evil tacos. Yeah, maybe it's time for the third, third one of those. I'm not sure. And I won't be able to make that decision until I get some more sleep. No Q&A. Because I can't see you guys. I'm just shooting this in my house. Thank you so much for coming to my presentation. I hope you look out for the Hazardous Tales books. And I hope you keep reading history comics. Branch out. There's so many great things that are happening in comics right now, particularly the type of comics that you can find in your school library. Um, I'm excited to keep working. I'm excited to have finished book number 10. Look for it. Thank you so much for uh, for coming to my, uh, my uh, little mini online Comic-Con presentation. Keep reading those comics. Keep my little history restaurant open. Thanks, everybody. Have an excellent day.